Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back. This is episode number 400. 400 shows. I I don't even... What did we even talk about? (laughs) I want to say thank you to everybody who's made this possible. To keep going for 400 episodes is pretty epic. I don't have anything special planned outside of bringing you a really, really great paper. want to let everybody know it was my mistake. I released the episode because I was going to be out of town. I released it early at 9.30 a.m. instead of 9.30 p.m. My mistake. Bonus, I suppose. Probably a few extra downloads this month just because of that, which is cool. So there was that. I just got back from Esotericon in Manassas, Virginia, where it went off like gangbusters. It was insane. It was so cool to hear all of the brothers give these fantastic talks about the deeper elements of the ritual, which of course is what we're supposed to contemplate and come to these conclusions. And of course, these esoteric talks really assist us in unpacking the deep materials that lie within the ritual. I gave a talk on apotheosis and quantum entanglement, and I think it went okay. (laughs) Um, I got a lot of questions, which I really thought was wonderful. You know, sometimes you give a presentation, and there's no questions, and you just have blank stares, and that's how you know you were either way over somebody's head, or they just thought you were crazy. I had a ton of questions, including questions from the Worshipful Master, and I just was so grateful to be there and to be able to answer questions and to talk about my little presentation. So again, a huge shout out goes to Brother Joe Martinez and Brother Kevin Homan for putting on this event, really taking the bull by the horns and showing Masons around the world that you can create something like this and put a emphasis back on the spiritual slash contemplative art of Freemasonry. So, speaking of conferences, next one is coming up. That's going to be July. We're going to the South Pasadena Masonic Con. This one is going to be huge if everything goes off the way Brother Dago and the brothers of that lodge have put it together. The amount of content being shared over the weekend, that's right, it's a multi-day event, is really crazy. So go to MasonicCon.com to learn more, and I hope you guys all come out. I hope you guys come to one of these great conferences that's happening. I seem to find my way to all of them this year, and it's like the luckiest year ever for me, right? So uh, if you can go, go, do yourself a favor, check it out. You won't be disappointed. I know that. Now, we're going to get into the article in just a moment. And what we're doing in this episode is we are continuing some of the really cool stuff that we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about Solomon, king of Israel, and this thing called the Shamir. I was contacted by a brother who said you might want to check out this really cool article that appeared in the Rocky Mountain Mason magazine. And of course, like I needed an excuse to buy another Masonic magazine. First of all, I asked Brother Patrick Day, who wrote the article, if I would be able to read the article on the show. And Brother Patrick said, yes, you can read the article on the show. And he thought I maybe wanted to read just a portion of it. I said, no, I'd like to read the whole thing to give the great context and to put his writing out there and to really also promote the Rocky Mountain Mason magazine. You know, there's not many Masonic magazines out there today. You know, I think about back in the day, in the 1990s. Yeah, that's back in the day for me. uh, Going to a Barnes & Noble bookstore or um, Borders, if you guys remember those, And there would be a magazine rack that would have magazines on any subject you could think of. You would find a magazine on doilies or bottled water weekly or, you know, you name it. 
and there's just not a whole lot out there for masons. We've talked about it before. Of course, there was the working tools. There was living stones. There's Rocky Mountain Mason Magazine. There's the California Freemason. There's Freemasonry Today. There's Every State's Grand Lodge Magazine. I guess California Freemason falls into that also, but it's probably more of a magazine magazine with articles rather than just saying what the Grand Lodge did this month. So this is all fantastic. Uh, but the real big players I feel in Freemasonry today, as far as magazines go, I do want to recognize the Philalethes magazine and also the Masonic Journal. Right, those those are out there, and I think they're um, a little smaller in content, and I think they come out quarterly. I can't remember. I still get Philalethes, but the Rocky Mountain Mason Magazine and the Southern California Lodge of Research Magazine, the Fraternal Review, are kind of like my favorites. So again, a huge thanks goes out to the Rocky Mountain Mason Magazine, all of the brothers there who put the content into that magazine over and over again, and uh, just a special one goes out to Patrick Day. We're going to read his article from the latest issue that you can get today, and I'll tell you how to get that magazine and get this issue right after this. And before we get into this, I want to mention that you're going to hear me talk about the online great books program within this small advert that we do for the show. And I want to say that they're opening enrollment again from July 8th until the 14th. So it's really important that if you're interested in starting and getting on this program that you're going to hear about, that you think about it soon because the enrollment window is so small. It's only six days to enroll in the program. And it's a fantastic program. Anybody who has taken the program, who's in the program, will tell you great things about it. So onlinegreatbooks.com. Use your promo code that you'll hear about in just a moment. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to wcypodcast.com, you can click on direct donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on. In the beginning of the program, of course, you can make that one-time donation or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose, really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com. But also, we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis, who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beard and Skin Care. He's been so generous. If you head to WCYPodcast.com, click on More, then click on Bankers Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more then go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to on it.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it you can get it on audible kindle or in print 
even on iBooks. And last but not least, I want to ask you to check out the Great Books program. You'll see the banner for it on the left hand side, Intellectual Linear Progression. Use the promo code WCY or you can just click on that link there and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from Scott Hambrick about how awesome the program is. So that's it. I hope you guys enjoy and thank you so much for helping us out. All right. Let's go ahead and get into this issue of the Rocky Mountain Mason. Now, before we start, again, a big thanks to Ben Williams and Patrick Day for letting me read this. If you would like to get a subscription to this magazine or just get more information on it, head on over to www.rockymountainmason.com. The cost for this magazine, it has to be $33.00. Per annum, so thirty-three dollars a year, and you can mail a check to them. But more importantly, you can just hook it up with some PayPal right there online. And uh, I have to say, I have never subscribed to a magazine and received an issue this fast ever. I ordered the magazine and I back ordered one issue, and they sent both to me within four or five days. I was just mind blown. So again, RockyMountainMason.com. This article is a long one. This will be the only content this week. It's very intense. It's really cool. And I think you really enjoy it. King Solomon, the Sorcerer, and His Magical Tradition by Patrick Day. From the prohibition of iron at the temple to the magical tradition attributed to Solomon. Quote, Glendower. I can call spirits from the vastly deep. Hotspur. Why? So can I. Or, so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? End quote. William Shakespeare, Henry IV, 3, 1, 51 through 53. There are several times in Masonic ritual and instruction that we are informed that King Solomon's temple was erected without the sound of axe, hammer, or any tool of iron. This, of course, comes directly from the Old Testament, quote, The house was built with stone, finished at the quarry, so that neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron was heard in the temple while it was being built. End quote. Quote, unquote. It might seem strange to you. We are told in the Entered Apprentice degree that the building of such stupendous magnitude could be erected without the aid of some iron tool. Indeed, it is quite strange that such a feat could be executed. But Masonic tradition informs us that the stones were all hewn, squared, and numbered in the quarries where they were raised, the timbers were felled and prepared in the forests of Lebanon, conveyed in floats by sea to Joppa, thence by land to Jerusalem, where they were set up by the aid of wooden setting malls. This is actually a fairly reasonable explanation of why there was not heard on the building site the use of any iron tool, For the iron tools were being worked in the quarries or in Lebanon, and everything was organized and planned so that all that was necessary to assemble the stones and timbers was to tap them into place with a wooden setting mall, as explained in Masonic Ritual and the Old Testament. While this is an interesting method of construction, it stands to reason to ask a very logical question. Why were iron tools not used on the building site? What was the purpose of doing things this way? Any answer to this question is conjectural, but there are some logical explanations, or one explanation is that the use of iron tools, or tools in general, were taboo in constructing sacred objects, as prescribed by God in the book of Exodus. You need make for me only an altar of earth, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your offerings of well-being, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. But if you make for me an altar of stone, do not build it of hewn stones. For if you use a chisel upon it, you profane it. In this instance, the taboo is against any tool in general being used in constructing an altar to God. Stones for the altar must be raw and unfinished, as found in nature. Furthermore, this taboo concerns altars, not temples, and was largely practiced while the Israelites wandered in the desert. For our purposes, this biblical taboo is not sufficient to explain why there would be a prohibition on iron tools at the building site. 
Certainly there was not a prohibition on hewn stone, nor with iron in general for the edifice itself. We read in the first book of Chronicles that King David began to amass all the materials necessary for his son Solomon to build a great temple to God, and so ordered hewn stone and timber, as well as great stores of iron to be used for nails and clamps on the gates. King Solomon's temple is not the only instance nor are the Israelites the only culture to have a particular taboo against iron in regards to sacred things. James Fraser lists a number of examples of iron taboos in his gold bow. For instance, not only was it forbidden to touch the king of Korea, but also he was forbidden to touch iron owing to his divine status. Roman and Sabine priests were forbidden from shaving in purity rituals with an iron instrument, but rather had to use bronze razors. Iron was prohibited to be brought within Greek sanctuaries. In several cultures, with steel knives being prohibited, animal sacrifices were thus performed with obsidian or quartz knives. Fraser also mentions the Pons Sublicus, the first public work project of the Romans, which was a bridge crossing the Tiber River that was made entirely out of wood, no iron. Plutarch says the bridge was sacred and was constructed without iron to observe the counsel of the oracle, but it is just as probable that such a construction made it easier to tear down, but it is possible that such a construction made it easier to tear down the bridge in the event of an enemy invasion, as was the case for Horatius Cocles. Frazier remarks that the objection to the use of iron might have been a conservative reaction to a new technology. In the area of the world where the ancient Israelites lived, iron was a fairly new material, as the building of the temple takes place a few hundred years after the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. Not only was iron a relatively new material, it is a metal with peculiar properties, namely, it is magnetic. Magnetism has long been associated with magic and comprises an intense portion of ancient alchemical practices and studies. Discussions on the lodestone, magnetum, can be found in esoteric and natural magic literature across numerous cultures throughout the ages, from Pliny the Elder to Albertus Magnus, from the Sepharaziel to Eliphas Levi. The lodestone has been the source of much preoccupation. It is possible that the magnetic properties of iron may have been the very reason a prohibition was set against the substance in the temple's construction, as it would have been a fairly misunderstood and strange material to use on such a sacred edifice. Whatever the case is of exactly why iron was forbidden at the building of King Solomon's temple, or how we try to argue it today, a number of strange traditions developed over the centuries that attribute this feat to various occult methods. Some are benign, though strange, and others venture into the mysterious and dark aspects of occult magical practices. Let us begin with some of the more benign occult workings attributed to Solomon. In the Jewish Mishnah, tradition of the Talmud, there is an explanation of how Solomon was able to cut stones and build the temple without iron tools. The feat was accomplished with the assistance of a tiny worm called the Shamir which is the seventh of the ten wonders created by God on the eve of the first Sabbath of creation. Of these ten wonders, there was created the cistern that accompanied the Israelites in the desert, Balaam's talking donkey, the rainbow, the manna, the stylus and tablet, and the Hebrew alphabet, as well as, quote, the shamir, the worm that helped build the temple without metal tools, per k, avit, 5-6. Elsewhere in the Talmud, it states that the shamir was, quote, used to shape the stones for the altar, end quote. The term shamir is used three times in the Bible and is usually translated as adamant or flint and designates an immensely hard stone, but is often used in the metaphysical sense of a hardened heart covered by sin. Later interpretations spoke of the shamir differently, namely, as a living creature that could cut immensely hard stone. Rambam comments that the shamir is a creeping thing that chisels large stones when placed on top of them. The 15th century rabbi Obadiah ben Abraham Bartnura gives the following commentary on the shamir. It is like a type of worm, the size of a grain of barley in its entirety, 
when they would place it on the stones that they marked with ink to demark what they wanted cut, the stones would become indented on their own, and with it did they engrave the stones of the vest Ifad and the breastplate of Aaron, as it is written about them, in their fullness. Elsewhere it is said how the Shamir engraves the names of the twelve tribes of Israel on the stones of Aaron's breastplate, which was accomplished by writing the names in ink upon the stones, showing the Shamir the stone, and with its gaze it would inscribe the names where the ink was laid. If the Shamir is capable of cutting and breaking anything, how then is it stored? Well, it is wrapped in tufts of wool and placed within a leaden vessel filled with barley bran. This soft lining surrounded by similar sized grains keeps the Shamir contained. So where did Solomon find such a strange creature? According to Mishnah, by the assistance of demons. Quote unquote, but King Solomon was a righteous servant of God, one might cry out. Was he now? It is easy to get caught up in all of the wondrous and magnificent deeds and sayings of Solomon, but further reading into the king, and we find that he spirals into folly. In his old age he had amassed a horde of foreign wives, a thousand wives to be exact. Solomon had been forewarned to not let these foreign women sway his heart. But eventually he began to worship and sacrifice to Astarte and Moloch, and even build temples to Chemosh and Moloch. This so enraged God that he promised Solomon that he would rend his kingdom apart. Islamic traditions hold that Solomon regularly consorted with demons called jinn or genies. For instance, the Quran speaks of Solomon's control of jinn and how he used them to build the temple. And to Solomon, we the angels subjected the wind. Its morning journey was that of a month, and its afternoon journey was that of a month. And we made flow for him a spring of liquid copper, and among the jinn were those who worked for him by the permission of his Lord, and whoever deviated among them from our command, we will make him taste of the punishment of the blaze. They, the jinn, made for him what he willed of elevated chambers, statues, bowls like reservoirs, and stationary kettles. We said, Work, O family of David, in gratitude, and few of my servants are grateful. Jinn were even present at Solomon's death, when a worm had eaten through his staff and caused him to fall, and the jinn were ashamed they did not know of the unseen worm. In addition to controlling the winds, Solomon also had command over birds and horses, as he could speak with animals, which partially composed his army of men and jinn, and with whom he frequently would consult. He even used jinn to bring the queen of Sheba's throne to him, before she arrived in Jerusalem. Even the wisdom of Solomon itself has been interpreted as a demon that God put within King Solomon in the sense of the Greek daemon, or Latin genius, a personal attending spirit. This interpretation can be derived from scripture when God says, quote, I give you a wise discerning mind, end quote, as if God's implanting in Solomon a wise mind. The original Hebrew literally translates as, I have given you a wise man as a son. The Septuagint Greek text translates literally as, I have given you a wise heart and wisdom, as you are begotten. A few things should be understood about the nature of spirits and demons during this time period, as well as the relationship between Solomon working with demons and his continued devotion to God. Firstly, demons were a fact of life, from Adam and Eve on up through the time of Christ and on through the Renaissance, demons and spirits were a given. They were not metaphors, nor were they abstract notions, but were considered to be very real entities. Secondly, demons did not have the same reputation in ancient times as they do today. Some were benevolent and others were malevolent, but for the most part, they were more or less ambivalent. In ancient magical practices, demons were considered nothing more than spirits that could be manipulated or coerced into doing the magician's bidding. Some spirits were more willing while others put up a struggle, and some obeyed the magician while others would trick him or her. In other words, spirits were similar to people. They can be industrious or lazy, loyal or lying cheats, and they can be nice or mean. We read in Plato's Symposium that everything demonic is between divine and mortal. In other words, if it is not the gods 
or of mortal life, but somewhere in between. Then it is in the realm of demons. Divine revelations and visions are transported from the gods to human via demons, and prayers and sacrifices are sent to the gods from humans by the aid of demons. Thus a demon might be considered good if it was serving a benevolent function, such as providing divine assistance. But they might also be considered evil if they carried out some sort of divine punishment, such as illness and death. It is only later in Christianity that spirits came to be regarded as evil in general, and only angels worked on behalf of God. Socrates himself had a demonian, literally a demonic or divine something. This divine something of Socrates came to him in childhood. It would speak to him as a voice, often warning him against errors, but never telling him what to do. Even Jesus himself could be thought of as possessing a demonian in the form of the Holy Spirit, which descended like a dove upon him. If we drop the holy part of the Holy Spirit and just consider it as a spirit, we will find examples of things that people were burned at the stake for in medieval Europe. Mary was impregnated by the Spirit. Jesus was frequently guided and directed by the Spirit when it would fill him and even led him out into the desert to be tempted by Satan. Many of Jesus' miracles are done by the power of the spirit, such as casting out demons, the spirit who also said to have raised Jesus from the dead. In fact, it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah that, quote unquote, the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And again, quote unquote, I have put my spirit upon him. The Gospel of Matthew attests that this prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled in Christ. Jesus even imparts the power of the Spirit unto his disciples, and that the Spirit will speak through them. Just as the Holy Spirit of the Lord dwelled upon Jesus, so too did the wisdom of God dwell within Solomon as an extra entity that guided him, but did not control him. In fact, the two demonians of Solomon and Jesus are quite similar. Some scholars have speculated that the wisdom of Solomon and the Holy Spirit are the same thing. In the Apocryphal Testament of Solomon, there are several instances in which the demon, a demon refers to Solomon's wisdom as, quote-unquote, he that in thee is reigning, and Solomon himself refers to the wisdom dwelling within me, as if it were an extra entity. Thus, the Holy Spirit that dwelled upon Christ functions in much the same way as the wisdom God put within Solomon, and these functioned just like Socrates' demon. So it is that Solomon possessed some kind of spirit, and he certainly worshipped, sacrificed, and built temples to other gods, many of them whom later Jewish and Christian theologians turned into demons. Example, Moloch, the demon of greed. Therefore, it is not unreasonable that we find exegesis literature, and tales that have Solomon consorting with demons. There is even a curious passage in the Gospel of Luke that very well may be the only reference to Solomon working with and exercising, from the Greek for to bind by an oath, demons. Shortly after exercising a demon from a man in the temple, Jesus is questioned by the crowd. He says to them, the queen of the south, Sheba, will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon, and see something greater than Solomon is here. Exactly what the relevance of such a claim after an exorcism is uncertain, unless we take this to mean that Jesus' own abilities as an exorcist would have caused greater astonishment for the Queen of Sheba, in many traditions she is considered a witch, than she had for Solomon's ability to exorcise demons. Now let us return to Solomon's use of demons to help him find the Shamir. The Mishnah gives us the following tale of how Solomon used the king of the demons to secure the Shamir. Solomon came to the priests and asked how he could precisely cut the stone of the temple without the use of iron tools. They tell him to find the Shamir which Moses used to engrave the stones upon Aaron's breastplate. They advised Solomon to capture two demons, a male and a female, and to torture them together. Through torture, they may reveal where the Shamir is hiding. Solomon did so, but the demons swore they did not know where the Shamir was, but told him that Ashmedai, or Asmodeus, the king of the demons, may know where. The demons informed him that Asmodeus lives on the mountain in a pit filled with water, which is covered by a rock and guarded with a seal. 
A servant of Solomon manages to get Asmodeus drunk and binds him with chains that bore the sacred name of God upon them. When the demon was brought before Solomon, the king asks him for the Shamir. Ashmedai tells him, The Shamir was not given to me, but it was given to the angelic minister of the sea, and he gives it only to the wild rooster, also known as the Tukifat, or Hupo, whom he trusts by the force of his oath to return it. Solomon sends servants to find the hoopo nest with the chicks therein, and has them place a glass plate over the nest. The hoopo, unable to access the nest, brings the shamir to crack the glass. A servant captures the shamir, and the hoopo kills itself for losing the shamir and breaking its oath. Solomon kept the demon bound until the temple was completed. One day, Eshmadai convinces Solomon to release him from the chains and to give him the magic ring with the name of God upon it. Solomon does so, and Eshmadai promptly eats the ring, grows to an enormous size, dethrones Solomon, and takes his place. Solomon does, however, later reclaim his throne. Where is the Shamir now? The Mishnah tells us that it ceased to exist after either the destruction of the first temple or second temple. This is all, of course, very controversial to many Western Christians who view all spirits and demons as servants of the devil, and thus rendering all demons as being inherently evil. Certainly, there were people who felt this way in antiquity, but the idea that all demons are evil was not a common opinion. It is far beyond the scope of this paper to address the concept of evil and spirits in the ancient world or the evolution of spirits and demons into servants of the prince of hell, as well as what magical and demonic workings were deemed acceptable or damnable in ancient religious practices. Regardless, there were religious and esoteric traditions that were of the opinion that there was a means of working with demons through the graces of God, and this would be where a further look into the other occult traditions would be necessary to understand how Solomon could work with demons and still maintain his devotion to God. While there are a number of sources and texts that discuss Solomon as a sorcerer and conjurer of demons, one of the earliest texts to describe Solomon as such is the infamous Testament of Solomon, dating to the 1st to 5th century AD. The Testament of Solomon is a strange composition of Greco-Roman magic that is primarily based on the Greek magical papyri, with a great deal of Jewish and Christian mysticism and occult elements mixed in. It exemplified the transition from the PGM, the Greek magical papyri, to the Solomonic grimoires of the Renaissance, which will be discussed later. In the Testament of Solomon, King Solomon prays to the Lord to help him put down a demon that is tormenting a young child. The archangel Michael brings to Solomon a magic ring with the pentalpha, five A's arranged as a pentagram, or five-pointed star, inscribed upon it. This was used to bind the demon. Having captured the demon, Solomon begins to interrogate him, asking who he is, what is his business, and what angel frustrates him. An example, the angel that can be invoked to coerce the spirit to do Solomon's bidding. He reveals himself as Orneus, and that he strangles lusty men, that he is thwarted by the archangel Uriel, and is fearful of iron. Spirits fearful of iron is something we will return to momentarily, but Orneus's firm phobia adds to the prohibition of iron tools at the construction of the temple. Gathering this information, Solomon praises the Lord and orders Orneus, in the name of Uriel, to go and fetch the prince of the demons, Bezel Baul, and then sets Orneus to cutting stone for the temple. Bezel Baul, having been bound and brought forth, is interrogated by Solomon of his business and thwarting angel. Bezel Baul, thus bound, then assists Solomon in bringing forth all the other demons under his command and is forced to cut the marbles for the temple. A total of 59 demons appear before Solomon for interrogation and are either set to work on the temple or are sealed away in jars. In all instances, Solomon is not fraternizing with demons but is firstly praising God for this assistance to build the temple and to rid the world of malevolent entities, and secondly, exercising, literally binding, and commanding them by the power of the angel that opposes each specific demon. Consider Solomon's workings this way. 
if you personally cannot get a problematic coworker of a higher rank than you than yourself to shape up and stop causing trouble, you would then go to their manager or boss to get them under control. Sometimes you do not even need to go to their boss directly, but rather threaten to do so, and they will suddenly become compliant and polite, and in so doing you also give praise to the owner of the company. Josephus, the renowned historian of the Jews of the first century, relates Solomon as an exorcist of demons and a sorcerer. He tells us, quote, God also enabled Solomon to learn that skill which expels demons, which is a science. He composed such incantations also by which distempers are alleviated, and he left behind him the manner of using exorcisms, by which they drive away demons so that they never return, end quote. Josephus also mentions a man, Eleazar, who worked as an exorcist using a magical system ascribed to Solomon and that he had personally seen Eleazar doing such work successfully. This magical system ascribed to Solomon is better known as Solomonic magic. The time period Josephus is writing his Antiquities of the Jews is almost contemporary with the Testament of Solomon and would indicate that the magical system ascribed to Solomon is at least a century or two older than Christ. The Testament of Solomon is not considered a grimoire, though it does contain a number of magical prescriptions, incantations, and descriptions of phylacteries and protective amulets given throughout the text. It most likely is the source of later Solomonic grimoires. It is not my desire to discuss here the inner workings and procedures of Solomonic magic, as it is far beyond the scope of this paper and beyond my field of knowledge. I wish to approach this magical tradition by a comparative method of historicist occult texts to understand potential genealogies and relations of how later occultists perceived Solomon as a conjurer of demons, as well as how these grimoires utilize iron in relation to spirits. Firstly, it should be understood that the Western magical tradition is a broken tradition. Unlike the magical traditions of the Orient, which have preserved the same occult practices for thousands of years, most Western magical practices have their origin in a magic system that was partially preserved through practicing magicians and their sorcerers in ancient Alexandria, who wrote down their spells and operations. These magical workings, prayers, tables, charts, prescriptions for amulets, and phylacteries, etc., were written down on dispersed papyri which were later compiled and translated during the antiques hype of the 18th and 19th centuries. These texts are known as the Greek Magical Papyri, or PGM. The PGM is, is critical in its foundation of Western occult practices, but most of its contents are incomplete and frequently state things like, quote-unquote, do the usual, without any explanation of what the usual is, which indicates lost material. Most of this material was lost due to the various Roman rulers who sought to have this magical tradition stomped out as it posed a threat to their rule and the empire, and the same done later under the rise of Christianity and again in the spread of Islam. There are three main magical traditions that are purportedly derived from the Old Testament and which have their roots in the PGM, the tradition of Enochian magic, which was supposedly transmitted to Enoch from the angels as attested in the apocryphal book of Enoch and was popularized by John Dee and Edward Kelly in the 16th century through their communications with angels. Then there is Mosaic magic, which is claimed to have been passed on to Moses by the Egyptians, and is preserved in texts like the 6th and 7th book of Moses. And finally, there is Solomonic magic, which allegedly traces its origins to Solomon's workings with demons, and is preserved in a number of texts like the Sworn Book of Anoiris, the Hygromantia, the Key of Solomon, and the Lamegaton. All of these are magical systems developed or codified during the Renaissance, though maybe as early as the Middle Ages. What makes Solomonic magic different from other grimoires is that demons are summoned by invoking the name of God with the protection and assistance of his angels, just as what was demonstrated in the Testament of Solomon. Other practices have the magician working with demons directly and even making pacts with them. Example, the Grand Grimoire the Faustian grimoires, and the rest. Some grimoires will also prescribe invoking the name of Lucifer instead of the angels to command the spirits, 
Others prescribe working strictly with angels, and even summoning your own personal holy guardian angel and binding it directly to your head. Examples would be the Abramelon, Enochian magic, and the practices of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. What is curious in all of the Western magical traditions from the PGM to the Book of Oberon is that iron instruments, knives and swords, are used for protection such as drawing out the protective circle, banishing a spirit, releasing a spirit after working with them, known as the license to depart. Some modern-day magicians see this as a sharp cutting procedure that spirits respond to as if they are sensitive to sharp metal, or it is simply iron and steel that they do not like. That is unless the spirit is ruled by the planet Mars, in which case iron is its associative metal, and it's appropriate for such items as sigils. Such instances of spirits and demons being fearful or sensitive to iron and iron instruments can be found in various occult texts throughout the ages. Albertus Magnus relays to us in his Egyptian secrets that spirits may be put down via anthema that utilizes an iron brand. The Key of Solomon requires that the magic circles inside of which the magician will stand for protection against the spirits be drawn with a consecrated knife, sword, iron pen, or other instrument of the magical art. Eliphas Levi speaks of an instance in which he was conducting a magical ceremony in the summoning of a spirit, but the spirit refused to come because Levi was holding a sword. Once the sword was put down, the spirit came to Levi. There are an exhaustive number of examples. Aside from these extensive procedures of ceremonial magic, common folk charms and superstitions utilize iron to exercise or repel spirits. For instance, there is the old good luck charm of hanging a horseshoe over the door inside the house. Many folk superstitions involving setting certain items, plants, or signs over doors and windows or upon the sill, such as St. John's Wart, Dream Catchers, or Garlands of Garlic. The idea of these practices is to ward off maleficent entities and invite beneficent spirits. Thus, the horseshoe, which is made of iron, repels spirits of bad luck but welcome spirits of good luck. Pliny, the elder, describes the use of iron to drive away diseases and various maladies, which in Roman times would have been thought to have been caused by vengeful gods and malicious spirits. There is also the folk practice of exercising malicious ghosts and spirits by banging pots and pans together, usually cast irons. In this case, it is the loud noise itself that expels poltergeists as well as the sound of iron clashing, and even the iron itself. Purportedly, cemeteries are surrounded by iron fencing to keep the spirits within from escaping. There is also the charm of burying a steel knife under the doorway to one's house to keep evil spirits and witches from passing through. Sometimes a piece of iron is laid under the bed of a pregnant woman to prevent evil spirits from assaulting her or the child that she bears. Just like the ceremonial magic examples, the folk magic examples are equally numerous and exhausting. Suffice it to say that spirits do not like iron, or sharp metal in general. Why they do not like it is a matter of debate. Modern day magicians agree that spirits are pheromphobic and eichmophobic, but their speculations as to why this is so differ, if they speculate on the matter at all. Perhaps spirits can actually feel sharpness and it is unpleasant to them. Or maybe the sort of spirits the magicians would want to call are peaceful and benign and thus are repelled by a metal associated with a war god, Mars. Maybe it's magnetism. It may even be possible that the whole matter roots back to the prohibition of iron tools at King Solomon's temple. Whatever the case may be, we seem to have come full circle or at least looped back to the initial topic. Why was the Temple of Solomon constructed without the aid of iron tools? We have taken into account the Masonic and Biblical explanations of iron tools being worked on the stones and timbers off-site, and then we ventured into the more esoteric tales provided in the Talmud, namely, that of a tiny worm called the Shamir that could cut through stone of any density. We delved further into this esoteric explanation of the Shamir, as Solomon was able to obtain it through the use of demons bound to his commands, which led us to explore several historical and apocryphal texts that describe Solomon acting as a sorcerer, capable of summoning demons and binding them to his bidding, that by the grace of God and his angels, in building the temple finally, in building the temple, finally we explore a magical tradition that is purportedly 
passed down to us from Solomon himself on how to call, bind, and command demons. From this magical tradition, we glossed through some examples of how these occult practices describe a certain abhorrence of iron and sharp metals in the presence of the spirits, and further how iron has been used to repel spirits in common folk superstitions. Thus, we find ourselves at a potential chicken and egg conundrum. Do divine things loathe iron because the temple was constructed without the use of it? Or was there a prohibition on iron tools because divine things are fearful of it? Or do angels and demons have absolutely nothing to do with it? Certainly, nothing has been answered here, nor are we any closer to the answer of this problem. As stated at the beginning of this paper, any answer would be conjectural since the builders, the priests, nor King Solomon himself wrote down why the temple was constructed without the aid of iron tools. As can be gathered from this lengthy survey of explanations given throughout history, no one knows with any certainty why iron was prohibited at the building site. But some bizarre and fantastic propositions have been put forth, which have given way to some even stranger and more mysterious occult practices. Wow. There you have this excellent article by Brother Patrick Day. Again, can't thank you enough for putting this together. What a fantastic article. I loved how you weaved in and out of all of it. You guys, if you like this kind of writing and you want more of it, then you got to pick up the magazine, The Rocky Mountain Mason. Again, 33 bucks. Go to the website. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks again to everybody who I met at Esotericon. Thank you very much for the compliments on the presentation. If you're interested in having me come out to do a presentation, just get a hold of me. You can email me at wcypodcast at gmail.com. You can also email me there if you have any questions about anything, suggestions for show topics or, again, anything at all. Don't forget about the Great Books program. You're going to have open enrollment real soon in about a week and a half, so check that out. Thank you again to all of the people who support this program, and a special thanks once more to Brother Joe Martinez and Brother Kevin Homan for putting everything together. Nothing against you, Kevin. Kevin likes French press coffee. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Joe, I got to say thank you so much for allowing my wife and I to come out and to stay there with you and your family who were just amazing. And true story, everybody thought that Joe's wife and my wife were sisters separated at birth. They uh, they got along. <laughs> They're very similar, but it was awesome. So, And I just want to say also thank you to everybody out there who was at Esotericon that met my wife. And you know my wife is very active in the philosophy of masonry and uh, talks about it all the time. And I always say that she's more of a mason than I am. So um, thank you to all the brothers out there who really were so kind and gracious when meeting my wife. Uh, she was so excited and happy to see all of you. And I, and I should probably say on the air, that uh, my wife says, hands down, Al Leathers. Brother Al Leathers gives the best hugs. So, uh, Brother Al, I love you, man. And with that, you guys all have a wonderful week. Stay on the level. For whence came you, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.